So here's my metal detecting research video. We're going to go over some techniques that I use for about every site that I go to. And I'm going to try to make this as quick as I can. And if I leave out some details, just ask questions. So let's just dig right in. Now some of these techniques are going to maybe seem pretty basic. So if you're already doing them, that's great. But not everybody is, so I'm just going to share them. The first one that I use most of the time is visually. I'm looking for signs of old homes. And uh, what I mean by that is not only an existing standing home, but a home that would have been there and fell down a hundred years ago. A lot of times landowners don't even know that they had ever been there. So it's up to you to, to look for clues to find them and then investigate. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are, you can look for depressions in the ground. You know, everybody's looking for cellar holes with the big rocks lining them. They're not always like that, especially if it's farmed or if somebody filled in the hole so that, you know, somebody that's out farming or walking through the woods in the dark, who knows, you know, 120 years ago, they're not going to fall in the cellar and then break their leg. So uh, they fill them in. Now, cut sandstones laying in the middle of the woods, limestones that may look like a wall, but, you know, they make a 90 and they're just barely sticking out of the ground. Uh, so that it kind of looks like a foundation. And then there's the uh, times of the year, especially in the spring, looking for lilies and tulips and the perennials that come up. Now that I use, I've used many, many times over the years and it's pretty much 80% always right. If you're walking through the woods or driving down the road and you see some lilies coming up in the middle of a, a field, say in April, May or June, and uh, it's just really out of place. Uh, nine times out of ten, there's going to be an old house that used to have been there. You know, the plants survive year after year, and they always come back. Now, if it's down like an old creek waterway, and you find some up on the bank, that's not really a good indication because the bulbs can wash out of the ground. Squirrels actually dig them up and, you know, move them around just like they would carry nuts around. And uh, they get in the creek and they wash down the creek and then get reseeded and then they start blooming there. So if it's right on a creek bank, probably not good. But if it's 50 yards away from a creek bank, it's probably a, a good to go. Now it takes further investigation with a metal detector, but uh, that's usually a pretty good, a pretty dead giveaway. And then understanding visually what you're seeing when you're driving around that is still standing. A lot of older homes have been renovated. If it was a log cabin, you know, over the years, the chinking, which is the stuff that goes in the middle, the little rocks and the stuff that gets packed in there with it, uh, starts deteriorating and they get tired of taking care of that maintenance wise. So they'll cover it with either slapboard wood or vinyl siding or aluminum siding or all kinds of different, you know, things that they'll use on the exterior to make update it. Now that gets covered and then the house gets brand new windows and it looks like a brand new home. So you're looking at the foundation. Here's a good example. It's just like this house here. Does it look like it's older than the hills? Vinyl siding, shingles, looks like a poured foundation. Let's get up a little bit closer. You gotta look at what is exposed, like the foundation. You can see there's some bricks there and then uh, some kind of blocks. But back here, we can get a better view. These are what I would call a milk house block. They're glazed block. They look like brick. Uh, they're really big, but the inside of them is actually hollow, like that. And this is on the front of this house. It's a pioneer house. In 1984, this house was designated as being more than 100 years old. So this little house that may not seem all that exciting to metal detect, if it didn't have that plaque on the front of it, you would be able to tell that it is that old because of building components that were used during the age that it was built. Those blocks used as a foundation. Now after we took a look at that foundation, you can also look at the homes themselves. I usually use chimneys. Now, the arrangement of the chimneys and also what would be called like a summer kitchen um, will also date a house. You know, books like this one here, which is a field guide to American houses. It's by Virginia and Lee McAllister. This book is a guide that enables you to, to identify uh, a date on a home. It takes, you, you can't just pick it up and figure it out in 10 minutes. You can look through and you can find like a, you know, a Gothic revival house and realize it was really big in the 1910s, the 1920s, and they were building them homes, you know, one after another, and that was the style they were using. And then, but if you find an old home, a smaller home, like an old log cabin, those weren't really that big. 
and uh, sometimes uh, there'll be two chimneys, and you'll look at the arrangement of two doors on the front of a house, and you're like, I know exactly what that is. That's a double pin log cabin. And the only reason I know that and could tell that building is because of where the doors were at and also the chimneys, and I know it through this book. And now going back a little bit to the cellar holes, looking for just slight depressions in the ground. It doesn't always have to be the house. You're looking for you can uh, something that always settles, no matter it seems how many times you fill them up, is an old well. Wells were really deep, and you can put dirt in there, and the farmers would fill them up so nobody would fall in, and then it would settle over time. And it'd be a four, five, six foot diameter, and uh, they'll put trash and all kinds of stuff down in there. But if you can find that well, this odd hole that's you know in the middle of the woods that may have not been woods 120 years ago, um, that the house is going to be very close. Now, other things to look for is just the depressions in the ground where the foundation wasn't a cellar. Not all homes had cellars, so you know they were built above ground. So looking for just them, those line of rocks and just odd things that are in the woods. Anything can be a giveaway. And on that note, finding out who owns the property. Now I know there's cell phone applications that people use for hunting and stuff like that uh, as metal detector is to figure out who owns the property. But I do know that information is not real time and it's not official. The way that you get official information is through a county auditor's website or a property valuation administration's uh, website. Most of them have websites, but every one of them has an office. These will either be in the courthouse or in an annex of the courthouse, but they will be downtown and in every county. They're the ones that assess how, many ta how much taxes you pay on a piece of property, so they really keep track of that. So all I'm going to do is I'm on the internet right now, and I'm just going to type in the county that I'm in, Wayne, and then I'm going to type in auditor, and uh, Ohio, because there may be another county named Wayne somewhere in the United States. I'm going to hit enter. First thing that comes up is a Wayne County, Ohio online auditor. I'm going to select that. So now we have the website up. There'll be tons of information that you do not need to know. You'll be looking for something like right here over here, and it's property search. Property searches can sometimes have maps. Sometimes it's only just by names and address. So if you have an address or a name or you can find it on an aerial map, this, these are the forms that you can find it. Now, not everything's standardized between all counties or any state. It's all different. It's all depending on how much funds that that county has. So we're just going to go into search. And then a page will come up and you'll have to enter some kind of information. So I'm just going to type in a last name of Baker. Pretty common last name. So I'm just going to pick somebody. Now there's going to be a lot of information that you don't need to know, but say you had a piece of property and you looked up the address or this person's name and you'll get an address for the property, but many, many times it's owned by an LLC or somebody that doesn't live there. So we know the address of the property. That's great. But what we need to know is the tax mailing address. Where that bill goes to is where this landowner that's also stated on here lives. And that information is key in finding people that own property. So if it matches the same as the, the property's address, then they live on the property. But many, many times, pretty much 50% of the time, they don't live there. Now on this website, they don't you know show it to you big and bold, but you'll have to look in, on, the, on the screen. And see right here, this is map this property. Now, depending on how much funding your county has, they could have aerial mapping with all this information. Now, I'm don't, re not really interested in metal detecting this place, but here we are with an aerial photo that's up to date. It shows the houses and the buildings and the property. So I won't be trespassing on anybody else while I'm metal detecting. And I know exactly where it's at, the road names, I can pan out, and I can study any of this county. You know, I always talk about my mapping, this may look very familiar to you because this is where I get it. You know, uh, say we're going to try to metal detect down here. I can see the boundary lines, the road, and then compare these to older maps. And if all fails on accessing your county auditor or your PVA records online, just go to the office. The people in those offices are very nice and they're always ready to help. A lot of times whenever you have say these big farm fields.
farm fields aren't always owned by Jim Brown or somebody's name. Sometimes they're, you know, Marcon LLC or some, you know, corporation. A lot of these farms will do that so that they protect themselves by, you know, due to liability if somebody gets hurt on the farm. Separate that entity from their personal stuff. So I'm going to show you how you find that. So here we are back on the auditor's website where you find the names of people who own property. And say you wanted to metal detect this place here. You click on it and you find Oak Castle Farms LLC. We have no idea who owns that. What you go to is your state's, the Secretary of State's website for your state. The way you would search that is type in, say I'm in Ohio. So Ohio Secretary of State Business Search. You'll get a page similar to this. And I know it's the same in Kentucky as it is for an Ohio. And when you do this search, it's got to be typed in exactly as it's shown. So what I typically do is I copy the text off of the auditor's website, and then I paste it into the Secretary of State's website, and then I search it. So here it is, Oak Castle Farms, LLC, and then it'll show details. And what you're looking for is a registered agent. It's just, This is a business. So here's the name of actually who takes care of that Oak Castle Farms LLC. That'll be the person that you need to talk to. And there's the address of where he actually lives, which is nowhere near that farm from what I can tell from this address versus the mapping I was just looking at. So that's how you find out who owns an LLC in order to ask. This does take practice searching on the Secretary of State's website, but if you do like I did where you copy the name and paste it in, then nine times out of ten it works but sometimes it doesn't work because even a little comma in bet before the LLC or a period after the LLC will mess up the whole search so let's get into finding some of these old maps now any of these maps we find online there's gonna be other routes to take in finding these maps if you can't find yours online it doesn't mean it doesn't exist it just hasn't been digitized and then put in a place that you can actually search for it and find it but in searching on the internet, do not use the word map. Map will get you absolutely nowhere looking for old maps. Use the words, these words here. This is how I search, and it's been very effective. Type in historical, the second word. Use atlas. The third word is going to be what you're searching, which is going to be on a county level. Don't search on a statewide level or a city level. Always use the county. So I'm in Wayne County. So I'm just going to type in Wayne and with and county. And then I'm going to type in the state last, which is Ohio. And I'm going to hit search. So the first thing I come up with is a 1908, an 1897, an 1873, an 1856. They're all over the place. I have two favorites, which this one here is the 1856 map. Now, when you get these searches... Historic map works is going to show up, and you always hear about these people. Uh, but they're trying to sell you a map. Now, these maps were all public information back in the day. It's just they have an old copy of it, and there's not many copies out there left. So, in order to get a hold of them, they're going to sell you it. And it's only per sheet cost, and it's fairly expensive. So, another place that you want to look is the U.S. Library of Congress. If you get a hit on the U.S. Library of Congress, every bit of it's free. Every map that's on there is legit, and it has really good information on it. So we're going to go to that second, but let's just go check out this 1856 Historical Atlas. So this is on Historic Map Work, so you can see there's an image in the middle, and if you select on it, it comes up. Now, there's buttons down here to expand and make it the full size of the screen here. And then also using the wheel or other methods, however it may be, but I use the wheel, you can zoom in on the maps. Now, this is a, a big county, and then these are townships. Now, if you're in colonial lands like Kentucky or Virginia or Pennsylvania, you're not going to have this. You're just going to have precincts. Now, on this map, we have townships. And you zoom in, and some of these will only let you go so far. See how this historic map works is only letting me go in this far and it stops. That's as far as I can zoom in. They don't want me to utilize this information. They want to keep it fuzzy so that I have to pay the money to get a hold of it. So let's back back out of this website and I'll show you another route. So we just gained some information by going into 
1856 Ohio Historical Atlas put on the internet for you to buy by Historic Map Works. Right here is Baker's Map of Wayne County, Ohio, Library of Congress. Now, if we look at this, uh, this one that we just visited, that we can't zoom in very far, we can see the title on it over here and see this published by Baker. Well, the Library of Congress is calling it as it really is, Baker's Map of, of Wayne County, Library of Congress. So let's go over there. And these are all public records. So now we're going to select on this. It's going to come up really big. And they don't, they're not trying to sell you anything. So I can zoom as far in as I want to. And look right there. There's a sawmill. Mr. Flager's right there. M. Thomas there. P. Sats. All these houses. Every time you see a square, that's a target that you can metal detect. Look, it's S.H. Schoolhouse. Schoolhouse, graveyard, manor house, blacksmith, blacksmith shop. They all have all these little symbols on here. I don't know what SSM, maybe a sawmill of some sort. But all these places are places you can metal detect and research and find and relate these roads here back to that auditor's or property valuation administration or any map. It doesn't have to be on the internet. Just go get a a county map that's free at the county engineer's office and lay it out on the ground beside you, paper form, and compare it to something on the screen. This old map right here. Or you can print this map. You know, you have to print smaller sections of it in order to get the detail that you want. You know, I always zoom up really close. Now, if you don't want to do this, and I'm just going to say it for any map that we look at today on a computer, utilize your print screen button. Hit the print screen button, go into paint, and hit paste. There's the same map. You can, if you're good at paint, and you don't have to be, you know, super savvy at it, there's a select button up top here. And all, if I was going to metal detect this William Brinkerhoff's house, what I show you all, all I do is I pull this out and I cut it, I find a new drawing, and I paste it. And that's all I have. That right there. Exactly what I need. It doesn't matter what website I'm on, I can do that. So now that we've taken a look at the Baker's map, we can go back out and test some of these other websites. I had mentioned that there's some that are my favorites. Let's just go into Wayne County 1873 by Historic, Historic Map Works. See how it looks like there's a bunch of different pages where the other map was just one big map of the county. That's because these are pages in a book. These are actually real books that you can get in person. Take a look here. Here are three of them right here. There's two more in this office. I'm a land surveyor and we house these here. And they got old names and some clues that we use during, uh, for our work. But uh, this company acquired these through just people in the community that had them and passed them down through their families. So I didn't want you to get fixed on something where these are actually just scans on the internet of something. These are great big books that are actually utilized quite a bit. So just to let you know what you're looking at. And just a few notes about these old maps. Remember that the people that were making these maps, say it was 1860, you know, they could have been on riding a horse around for weeks on end trying to spot all these houses and make notes. It's raining, it's cold, you, you can't just stop at a general store and pick up a sandwich for lunch. You know, they, they were, it was a, a pretty hard job to do this. So if there's a house way off the road, they may have only just saw a driveway going back and maybe asked somebody, hey, is there a house back there? Who lives there? And that's how they got that black dot or black square out in the middle of the field. It's just back there somewhere, so they noted it, that somebody by this name has a house back there. Now, also remember that roads get vacated, shut down, they go away. New roads get built. So the names of the roads change. So if there's names of roads on maps, they can change over time. They reroute roads where there used to be a great big bend and now it's straight. So you'll see a lot of differences between your aerial photos of modern day to the old maps from back in the day. But you may be able to see you know, clues out in the field you know, where the road is now straight. You can see that ditch line you know, where they didn't go back and just smooth it off nice and pretty. You can still see the old tree rows on both sides of this you know, indention in the ground that's all grown up with, you know, bigger trees in it. But, you know, you could tell it was a roadbed. 
so you can look for clues like that to place yourself on the map. Sometimes it takes that physically out there driving through it, just pulling over and checking your map and looking around. You're like, okay, I see it now. So just remember that things change over time. Now, I know this video is going to be tough for everybody to get through. I'm rambling on. I'm showing you a computer screen. But maybe just do little bits at a time and uh, learn as you don't, you know, don't try to get all this in one shot. Uh, it takes a long time. I've been doing this for a long time. And uh, I'm also a land surveyor, so I deal with this stuff daily. Now, here's some other maps that are usually cover the whole United States. And uh, they're very valuable. They're called the Sanborn Fire Insurance Maps. These will also be on the U.S. Library of Congress's website. These are old. Uh, back when, you know, whole towns were built out of wood and one building caught on fire and then the whole street, both sides and everything burnt to the ground. Well, they started, you know, having fire insurance. So they would map and show all the risk involved. You know, if there was so many houses and what kind of heat they had and, and it's just a lot of details. So let's take a look at those. Now this is an internet search again. Sanborn, which is S-A-N-B-O-R-N-E. Fire insurance maps. Now, the first thing that comes up, you can see Sanborn Maps, Library of Congress. In my search, I forgot to put what county. Hold on. Wayne County, Ohio. So, Sanborn Maps, Wayne County, Ohio, of Ohio, Library of Congress. Now, these maps can get into some really good detail, especially if you're in the city. I haven't looked at them a whole lot around here, but I'm going to read out some of the dates. 1884 here's a 1892 and they, they you know they worked it took a long time to put these together so they span you know a little bit of time there's 1893 let's just pick that one this is from a town that's just east of here and uh, it looks like there's three images in this one we're just going to click on one and then there's an expand button this is 1893 in a town called Orville which is still in this county. And then look right here. So we have road names. We have like the structure size, the porches. You can see every little building in the sizes. You can see there was a Methodist church, Presbyterian church, a public school right here, which I know for sure is not there anymore. Look right there, there's a cistern out in the middle of the road so that horses and everybody can get water just in the middle of the city. So you think about how many people gathered around that. There's a mill down by the railroad tracks. You know, there's a passenger station for the railroad. People getting on and off all day there. Look, you can get lunch right there. So there was a, a shop right here that sold food to everybody getting on and off of this train right here. You know, they mark that stuff because there's people cooking in there, which is a risk of fire. So there's all kinds of detail on these maps and you can pan around on these things all day long. There's a tannery, a brick and tile works, a planing mill, another train depot. So these maps are invaluable. Here's another site that is somewhat difficult to use, but if you can get an image, then you pretty much have struck gold on a site. It's called Vintage Aerial. Vintage Aerial is a, a bunch of old maps that, that, they, that they used for uh, taxation. Somehow these folks got a hold of them, and now, now that they own them, they can. you have to pay in order to access them. So I'm just going to type in, it says discover rural America's history. So it, And it wants you to just type in an address or a place. So I'm just going to type in Worcester, Ohio. In these panels, they'll give you one photo, but there's a bunch of pictures in here. These aren't ancient pictures, but they do take you back in time. Here's a 1965 aerial of a farm. It'll, it'll actually give you an address for this one. Some of these don't have any addresses tied to them because they don't know what they go to. So if you go into right here, there's a film roll of 80 that are unknown. So this is all farms from 1963 era that were somewhere around here. And if you know where you're at and what your site looks like, you can actually see the house and where they park their, you know, the cars and utilize their, you know, their, their ground, you know, see where the gardens were and that kind of stuff. 
it will get you back in time. It won't get you back in the 1800s. But, it, you know, sometimes you can get all the way back into the 50s and early 60s, which can be very valuable. Now, the last online source that I have, which you can actually buy a copy that's on a DVD, but this is by far my most favorite online source. And the only place that they have it since the U.S. Library of Congress kind of went underneath attack two years ago on anything that dealt with the history of the Civil War, they shut it down. So Ohio State University has taken it over, and they house it, and you can do a search. But it's the official records of the War of the Rebellion. That's the American Civil War. And I always type OSU for Ohio State University. Here it is right here. Now what these are are official records from the American Civil War, the North and the South. Uh, correspondence that they had to either generals or other troops or you know, reporting where they camped and how many people they captured or what battle or skirmishes that they were in. Books 1 through 111 are in this document. But I think 53 are specific to correspondence from what I think but I may not be sure so if I wanted to type in something well I'm going to go back home in Kentucky I'm going to type in uh, Lusby's Mill now anytime Lusby's Mill shows up in a document they'll show all this stuff and these are all documents where keywords showed up so I'm just going to click on one and this takes time but this is some of the best reading that you'll ever have and all I did is I picked that first document sometimes it takes some you know, 10 documents before you find anything pertinent. But we can see there's a Brigadier General, McLean, and he's writing a letter to headquarters, uh, you know, the in the District of Kentucky in 1864 on June 30th. He's writing General. A rebel force is said to be encamped near Lusby's Mill, Grant County, Kentucky. The general commanding directs that you send a force of about 100 men mounted infantry or cavalry to that point at once with orders to thoroughly scour the vicinity and a bunch of other details you know some of this stuff gets pretty rough when they're talking because it's their real words you know you'll see cuss words and you'll see some slang terms in there that were okay back in that day but this is the real deal so if you have a place that you're looking or even in your town you're unaware of like a you know, a small camp that did recruiting or a grounds that they did like, you know, test firing of cannons and stuff like that. Or, you know, maybe a couple troops camped in your town, even though there wasn't any battles, but you'll find it all on here. So that's all our online searches. And with those searches that you could spend hours, days, weeks on end, just researching and looking and finding. You'll never stop on there finding new places to go check out. It's incredible the amount of information that's available these days versus when I first started metal detecting when I was 16. I'm now 38, and I had to go to all these offices and talk to all these people, and it was a lot of legwork. So feel lucky that all this stuff is online now. Now, getting off of being online, there's another way to do some research going into a map office or a county clerk's office that would be at your courthouse or like I said before an annex of the courthouse there's surveys that are out there that have details on them I'm going to show you a few now looking for surveys can be monotonous you'll get into these old books called plat books or survey books and you'll just start thumbing through until you find one that's interesting but sometimes they can be very interesting we can see here in 1896 a survey was done and what do you see on there there's a church up there at the top left now if a surveyor shows that there's a church right there it's going to be very close to that spot you could probably walk straight to it now not all surveys are as obvious as that one look at this survey there is no building shown it was done in 1970 but what do you see there in text at the bottom left old schoolhouse lot now, old schoolhouses used to be one-room schoolhouses. So if the school's gone and rotted away and they're dividing this up to build houses on in 1970, that school is definitely very, very old. And it was long gone at this point in time. And they're even calling it an old school in 1970. So all good clues. And it's not always a 
drawn building that's noted out as being, say, like a, a church like we just saw. It could be just details like this. And here's the last example of one. And you can see it's in October of 1934. We had a big building with a mark on it that said it was a church. And then we also had some text that said it was a school. But it could be just little details like this. You can see that there's a county road. It doesn't even have a name in 1934. And then there's another highway out here. And this is an old uh, creek running through here. And then you can, that creek right there. And then you got an H for house. And then you got something right there. And I'm assuming that other little thing may be a well. So they're just showing some improvements that were on the property. It's been accurately marked in 1934 by a land surveyor. And in the 80s and 90s, there was a lot of compilations of information within counties that were recorded for local history. Now, this is back home in Kentucky again, in my home county. And these books are, I've seen them for about every county that I've ever metal detected in. And people would bring, you know, old photos and name who they are and talk about churches and parts of town, you know, old surveys, pictures of old buildings, and talk, you know, you can figure out exactly where it's at, you know, old train stations, talk about the depots and just stories around town and how things developed over time. And there's tons and tons of history in there. You know, on this one, it's got old maps and old taverns from, I think this is uh, back in the... 1820 and uh you know it's just any information that would have been historical that could definitely help you out in finding you know very interesting places older places to go metal detect so that's my metal detecting research video i know it was long there was probably some parts that are pretty boring but i try to make it as quick as i can but i'm trying to help everybody out because metal detecting itself you know learning a machine figuring out its language and all the settings and getting out there and swinging it correctly and finding stuff. That's just part of the game. The hardest part to me, in my opinion, is actually just finding uh, a place to metal detect, something that's interesting, something that's old. And even though you can see it and you want to go metal detect it, you have to find out who owns it and how to contact them. And uh, just getting that down. And after you do a few of them, and using these these things that I've shown you here, these techniques on accessing old maps and uh, auditor's information or tax information, uh, you'll be able to find them too and easily acquire their name, where they're at. So when you knock on a door, hi, my name is, um, and then you can name drop them, old Mr. Jones. I know out in your field there used to be an old building. See, it's on this old atlas in 1853. And... Uh, you know, let them know some of the history. You can even, if there's a name on the old atlas, like Zimmerman or something, you know, Mr. there was a Zimmerman family that used to live out there. Get them interested in what you're doing. And uh, tell them, you know, you're respectful to the grounds. And, you know, I'll take care. I'll always call you and let you know before I come out there. I just won't show up. I won't bring a bunch of people with me. I won't leave any trash behind. I promise you I'll respect your land as if it was mine. All these things, you know, they don't know who you are. When you knock on the door, they probably think you're trying to sell them something. So just be nice. Dress accordingly. Uh, go during good hours of the day. During the winter around here, you know, it gets dark at 530. So in the wintertime, it's really hard unless it's on a Saturday. So if you show up at 6 o'clock in the summer, you have to think everybody's sitting down at dinner then, typically. But if you see maybe drive by their house every once in a while and they're outside, that's a decent time to approach them as long as they're not unloading groceries. But uh, just always just use courtesy, be kind, be truthful, maybe even offer up some of your findings. You know, tell them that, you know, if you do find something you really want, you know, let them know that it really matters to you to keep that. But say if you've already found 20 large cents that year and you find a couple out in that field, and you're getting a lot of really good signals out there and really cool targets, maybe give some of those up. You know, people that don't see those every day really enjoy them. So those two coins that you may give away, large scents, you know, you'll always have a place to hunt in that field. And those fields get churned up and turned and plowed every year. So every year that, that field out there is a totally new site. The dynamics in the ground are way different than the year before, you know, yielding many different finds every year.
It's always new. So it's just something to think about, and hopefully this helped everybody out in some way. So thank you for joining me, and until next time, take care.